Okay, we are live, I believe. Yeah, we are live. Hello, everybody. Hope you're well. Um, I am just on my own today. Uh, hopefully, my able and trusted friend, uh, Bill Wilmot, will be able to join us a little later. Uh, he can engage you uh, in the chat group. Um, if you have any questions, uh, he tends to moderate the questions, and then he'll ask them later for the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to go straight into this uh, uh, presentation now. Um, if uh, Bill doesn't turn up, I'll try and get to the questions eventually. But this is one video that is really meant to uh, for you to share freely, uh, download it, take any uh, part of it as you like. Um, when you have to discuss Bitcoin with relatively new coming uh, uh, people, relatively new to Bitcoin, how on earth would you explain what Bitcoin really is and how it works? So um, it's kind of simplified. So forgive me if it is very basic for you, but hopefully you'll discover something new and uh, something useful for yourself. So um, I'll just uh, screen share and go straight into my uh, little presentation. It's as I said, it's very basic. So I hope. Uh, you do enjoy this. So how is Bitcoin born? Uh, what is Bitcoin and where does it come from? Uh, and it's uh, a, a, a fair question because a lot of people are skeptical about it. And uh, hopefully this presentation will help answer some of those questions. Now, if you were to search Google for what is Bitcoin, the exact phrase, what is Bitcoin? The first thing comes up is a definition that they say. But what I would tell you is, it is something you cannot afford to ignore. It is so in your face now that for whatever reason you're holding back in getting to understand or know Bitcoin, um, sooner or later you will come across it and you will want to do something with it. Uh, and sooner is therefore better than later because it is something you simply cannot afford to ignore anymore, uh, both from uh, the price uh, of Bitcoin, its performance in the last uh, few months, as well as its, uh, the noise it's making uh, in leading all the other cryptocurrencies into prominence. So the Google definition is easy to find, but my answer to you is, what is Bitcoin? It is simply something, a currency you cannot afford to ignore. And it is a currency. This is what we're going to discuss today. So usually when you come to Bitcoin, there's a bit of jargon attached to it. Distributed ledger, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized, proof of work, etc. cetera. Um, and what we're going to do is, I'm just going to switch off my Telegraph uh, app, sorry. Uh, oops. I believe I'm still sharing. So, you know, don't worry about uh, um, the uh, uh, wording associated with it. It may appear complicated. It may appear like, well, it's a bit of hard work to try and understand it. Just don't worry. Because these are words that are actually very simple, uh, but sometimes they appear more complicated than they really are. And that's my own discovery. Uh, you know, as you dig deeper, you're like, oh, that's that's all it is, really. Uh, you know, it's it's actually quite simple. So don't let uh, uh, words alone put you off. Uh, that's nothing to worry about. It's just jargon, and uh, you know, every kind of uh, 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 science or uh, even doctors have a jargon amongst each other. So don't worry about that. We'll get to understand what it all means. <clears throat> now, if you were asked to create a brand new currency for the largest nation on the planet. The largest nation on the planet is the internet because it includes people from every other nation. And if you were to put together the number of people connected to each other on the internet, uh, it far exceeds, the population far exceeds the population of any one nation. So it is the largest nation, technically speaking. And if the internet was one large global village, how would you design a currency that can be used by the internet, but at the same time, you have to prove that it has some value. Uh, it has something worthwhile. It's not just an email. It's something more than just an email. An email doesn't have value. There's people 
in the world that send out hundreds of emails every day, they can't have carry any value in and of themselves. And at the same time, it has to be something that can be easily used. It's very fast and relatively cheap to use. And also, it must have all the good qualities of traditional money, but it is only a currency, not money. There's a difference in the two. And it has none of the weaknesses of printed paper money, because printed paper money has a lot of problems. So if you were to design, now in hindsight, you can turn around and say, oh, well, you, I, I'll design something similar to Bitcoin, maybe better than Bitcoin. That's easy said than done. But when Bitcoin was being created, nobody else had hit upon this idea. At that point, when it was critical, at the end of the financial crisis in 2009, uh, one person or a group of programmers got together and they decided we need a solution for this financial mess that the regular currencies have made. How can we create something that has all these qualities? Used on the internet, has value, it's easy, fast, and cheap to use. It has all the good qualities and none of the bad qualities. And the result was Bitcoin. It's very simple as that, simply a currency of the internet. And when it comes to distributed ledger, traditionally, if let's say you wanted to buy something from a seller halfway across the world, your money would normally go via your local bank. It would leave your local bank go to the central clearing bank, and from there it would go to the bank of your seller and he would register the transaction at his end. Obviously, there'd be various payment uh, processes involved to show the transaction is complete, but essentially what happens is money goes from one bank to another bank through a clearing mechanism. So no matter how much or how little United States dollar you wanted to send from, let's say, Switzerland, or Japan or Saudi Arabia to Argentina, South Africa or Australia, or any other combination of countries. If it is United States dollars, the clearing bank will always be in the United States, specifically in New York. Uh, Chase Manhattan is one of the major clearing houses. Um, uh, and the federal ABA code CHA US 33 is what they normally use. The American friends will be familiar with that. Uh, but that's basically the central clearing bank for United States dollars. British pound would go via HSBC in London, and most of the time, euros go via Euroclear in Brussels. So there is always a central bank involved, but what happens is the transaction that you have sent from your side is limited to your bank. Nobody else can look at it, nobody else can see it. On the other hand, whatever the seller is receiving, all those transactions for reporting purposes are recorded by their local bank, and uh, nobody else can see it. So it's not uh, an open ledger. It's a closed ledger because your bank knows your stuff, their bank knows their stuff, and it's not normally visible to everybody else. Now, Bitcoin works very, very differently. It goes from you straight to the seller via the blockchain, and the blockchain is nothing but the internet itself, um, and a lot more, actually. The, the blockchain is a lot more sophisticated than just the internet. But it's basically an internet connectivity tool. And you, you send your money through the blockchain to the seller directly. There is no bank involved. But the reason it's called distributed ledger is because everybody connected to that blockchain, as you can see in these little figurines here, Everybody gets to see exactly what that transaction was. They may not know your name. They may not know the seller's name. They will only know your address and the seller's address and the amount and the date, but it is recorded for everybody to see. This makes it more transparent than the normal clearing bank system that we have been used to for all these years. So that's why blockchain is a revolutionary new concept. Um, it's actually not that new anymore because so many different professions are want to adopt this. It's useful for lawyers to uh, issue and track contracts with their clients and everybody else can see where, what the status of the contract is. It can be used by accountants. It can be used by so many different industries, by exporters, importers, blockchain, open, transparent transactions. And the more people that are looking at it, 
the more secure it is because there are that many more eyes to say that we have been able to verify this and therefore that are that many more witnesses to that transaction which makes it more secure now you heard the word peer-to-peer -peer. again very straightforward um, if it goes from you via the internet straight to the seller it's peer-to-peer -peer. it's from you to them they could be you so they could send some money back to you and the, the seller or the other counterparty could be a relative somewhere far away in a different country or different city and it's the same logic it goes from you directly to them using blockchain on the internet and uh, uh, just to make sure that you know it remains a secure transaction uh, there's encryption technology used that maintains its security on the other hand, the traditional system is actually very, very dangerous, but we've been used to it, and we don't ever question its uh, a weakness. And the weakness is the fact that when you make a credit card transaction, a lot of your personal data, that includes your date of birth, your full name, sometimes even your address, and the amount, and sometimes the per, uh, uh, purpose, etc. The the credit card strip has a lot of your personal data. It is sucked by the processor first. That whole bundle of information is sent to your bank. Your bank then goes back to the processor and verifies it and says, yeah, OK, they've got the money in the account, so you can make this payment. And yes, the person with this particular card number and the three-digit security code and all that is the right person. And the PIN number also matches. Can you imagine just how much information is floating about on the internet just because uh, you need to make a transaction. So you need to make a transaction, and in the whole process, your entire life story is being shared with so many different entities right there on the internet. And to say that this is secure, yes, they like to think it is secure, but it is also hackable, and basically your information is floating all over the internet every time you use the little strip on your Visa card. No matter, if you, even if you make a transaction in a shop, it's the same logic. They pull your data, send it to the bank, the bank verifies it, and then it approves it, and when it approves it, it go, then goes to the seller's bank and the seller gets paid. And that's when you see on the uh, uh, pin machine, on the card machine, it says transaction approved, and then you tear off your receipt and off you go. But in the whole process, you've shared your information out there on the internet, hoping that the system is secure. On the other hand, cryptocurrency, or Bitcoin specifically, works on a push basis. All you need is the sender's, seller's address and the amount, and that's it. You push it through the internet, and the seller receives the money, and that's it. There's no other detail shared. There's, there's no information, no private data of yours being pulled into the cyberspace, no date of birth, no name, no nothing, just one address to another address plus amount, and that's all you really do. So actually, from a transaction point of view, in a peer-to-peer -peer scenario, the uh, Bitcoin payment methodology is much, much more secure than the traditional Visa, MasterCard, Diners, Amex card transactions that we've been used to. Uh, if you remember, in the olden days, they had to uh, call a phone number and verify is this card OK or not. Uh, and in some cases, they had a little book with red numbers, which cards to accept and which cards to reject. They had a red listed numbers card, a booklet they used to send to the retailers. And that's why all these expensive transaction fees, et cetera, it's such a complicated process. That's why it's also very expensive, whereas Bitcoin is supposed to be almost cost free uh, or very low cost for transfer because it's so straightforward and simple. Now, what does peer to peer actually mean? Um, here is an example. This is a snapshot from a Wirex uh, 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 account. There is some Bitcoin in there, 0 0.7 something. It's worth about 188 US dollars. Now, if you wanted to send, all you do is decide how much of this you want to send. So if you decided 130, obviously, you would be using less than 0 0.71. So that particular Bitcoin amount will be sent to the address, this particular long address on the other side, and boom, it's done. You can even use a QR code here. Uh, if you have the QR code of the uh, the seller, just request it from them and stick it into your sending mechanism here. Decide how much you want, 
you've got the address, you've got the amount decided via blockchain, and boom, it goes. And each time it goes through the blockchain, everybody can see the transaction. They just don't know what it's for. They also don't know who you are and who the seller is, but the transaction is recorded. And if it is recorded, it is verified, which means it is a legitimate transfer you have made. If you've made it an error, well, you've lost the money. If you've made it knowingly, then, well, you are the one to have put in the address. You are the one to have chosen the amount. So you should be knowing who you're sending your money to, right? So it's as simple as that. This is how easy Bitcoin is to make a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. <clears throat> now, centralized. <laughs> I just thought I'll, I'll spice it up a little bit. Uh, but here's a picture of the uh, European uh, Parliament in Strasbourg in France. Um, for some bizarre reason, they uh, designed it to look identical to the Tower of Babel. Now, uh, uh, Europe isn't really a Christian uh, 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 continent anymore. Uh, it's post-Christian, mostly atheistic. Uh, but uh, for them to use a biblical motif, and the Tower of Babel was a sign of rebellion against God, a defiance that we don't care. We're going to build our own stuff without uh, God Almighty. So somehow they've gone ahead. And if you ever get a chance to read Revelation chapter 17, you'll find uh, there is a reference to the great whore of Babylon, uh, a woman that rides a beast. And funnily enough, you know, for, for a continent that isn't very interested in uh, the Christian religion anyway, they have used uh, this statue here of a woman riding a beast that is Europa riding a beast system is a statue right outside the European Parliament. And uh, they've used the same motif on the Greek version of the uh, two euro coin, a woman riding a beast. And even the German uh, popular magazine Der Spiegel uh, reports uh, Europa with the flag of Europe at the background, a woman riding a beast. I just find it ironic that they insist on using motifs that they themselves believe are part of fairy tale, uh, uh, but at the same time, they like to use it, or perhaps it is just biblical prophecy coming to pass right in front of our eyes. But the point of centralized here is that they do whatever they do, and the rest just has to put up with it. This is why Greece has been rioting, uh, Italy, Spain, and Portugal on the verge of bankruptcy, and they have really mismanaged the finances. And to add fuel to the fire, they've just gone ahead and printed so much money, trillions and trillions of euros more printed to bail out the banks and what have you, that actually the euro is on the verge of collapse, just like the Tower of Babel collapsed in the Old Testament story. Similarly, I don't believe the European Union will last very long, and yet they remain defiant. So I just thought I'll spice it up a little bit. but. Centralized is basically a few people controlling and exercising power over a lot of other people, and the people, the masses, not being able to do anything about it. They call the shots, and you just have to obey, full stop. Um, uh, I don't exactly know the, uh, the verses referring to uh, uh, the, the, this uh, particular passage in the Bible, but I'm sure you can look it up on your own. On the other hand, decentralized would be when someone like Muammar Gaddafi says, we don't want the dollar or the euro or anybody else to dominate all of Africa. We want to have something real, something gold-backed. So he came up with the idea of a gold-backed pan-African dinar uh, where all the African nations would have a common currency, but it would be backed by gold. The euro is backed by absolutely nothing other than the promises of the bureaucrats and politicians in this building. But whereas he wanted to back it by gold to make sure that everybody was reassured that the currency that pan-African countries would use, all of Africa would be able to use freely amongst each other, would actually have some value. Well, he was eliminated. I have a picture with him and Tony Blair that just goes to show that, you know, uh, friends can turn around and stab you in the back anytime. And the same happened with Saddam Hussein. Here he is with uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, Saddam Hussein, he wanted a gold-backed pan-Arab uh, dinar. And uh, as we know, he's also been eliminated. Why did he want this? Because he did not want a debt-laden uh, dollar to dominate the uh, uh, oil production and the Arab nations uh, being taken for a ride. 
But as we know, Saudi uh, 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 Arab has been in bed with the Americans for the longest time. And uh, uh, so he could not get all of them to agree. And eventually, you know, Desert Storm followed and you know the rest already. Uh, both of these guys eliminated, but they tried to decentralize power away from both Europe and North America. Uh, the European Union was formed uh, 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 just around the Second Gulf War. He, he was, uh, Saddam Hussein was eliminated after the European Union uh, came together with a single currency. And he said, well, uh, you know, long before that, he had his own ideas for a single currency for the Arab uh, nations. But this is another example of decentralized uh, uh, money that is not acceptable to those who uh, prefer to exercise centralized control. Uh, so this is Douglas Jackson, uh, CEO of eGold Incorporated. You may have heard of this company. Uh, by, uh, it launched in 1996, but by 2008, it was transacting $2 billion uh, worth of transactions. And uh, he was framed for money laundering and given a very long sentence, and then he pleaded guilty uh, just to get his sentence reduced because um, you know, whether he was actually money laundering or not is besides the point. Uh, what he claims is that his company was brought down because it was a gold-backed payment system that actually challenged the authority of the Federal Reserve and those who like to control payments and money. Uh, uh, and that's why I've put in here the statement, control the money and you control the world. Those who like to exercise control over many other people's lives, they don't like this kind of financial independence uh, that can be created by these ingenious new ideas. On the other hand, below here is Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal. You may know him as the uh, owner of Tesla Motors. Uh, he also came up with a better idea, a better peer-to-peer -peer email system that is PayPal, uh, email-based cash transfer system. You just need email addresses and a PayPal account, and you're able to transfer money from A to B, and that's genius. But he got out early. He was smart. He knew that he would either be thrown into jail or, some, or worse. Uh, so he sold out and started Tesla Motors and pursued his vision. Uh, but he got wealthy by doing it in, in the nick of time. Uh, and handed over ownership of PayPal to private equity. Now, that private equity, as we know from various different businesses that have absolute total sheer headaches from PayPal, we know that they are totally compliant with the centralized system and make life very difficult for businesses that want to freely move money between each other. And people should be able to move money between each other. Why does it always have to go through a central bank that can wrap you on the wrist for the silliest of excuses, even slap potentially false charges against you? But I don't know how false or true these charges are against Douglas Jackson. But the point I'm making simply is that anyone trying to break uh, or create something outside of the system, they just don't like it. Bitcoin is decentralized. Here, they can't do a thing. Why? Because you see, Bitcoin is so worldwide distributed, it's totally decentralized, that how many people are, going, are they going to uh, shut down? If they try and shut down South Korea, well, two more open up in Japan. If they try to shut down Japan, two more open up in China. And these are not central banks that are running the blockchain system of Bitcoin. These are people. And that's why it's true people power. Uh, it is not under any one person's control. And almost like a, a mythical beast that was uh, the Hydra, you know, it, it's got, you chop one head off and two more pop up. Uh, you try to stop it in one place, somewhere else it'll crop up. If the owner of, uh, the founder of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, had kept everything to himself and all the power within himself, it would not have taken off the way it has. The reason Bitcoin has taken off and has become a mighty force to reckon with is simply because it is decentralized. And this gives everybody a lot of comfort that it is not that easy to shut this thing down. And the network is simply based all over the world on the internet. How many governments would actually have to coordinate with each other to kill this thing? And for that, you would need a single worldwide global dictator to do that because there will always be countries at conflict with each other. If one doesn't like it, the other will go ahead and accept it anyway. So if you're sitting in India watching this and you've just heard today's news, 
uh, that uh, the finance ministry wants to try and uh, restrict cryptocurrency, don't panic. They'll only shoot themselves in the foot. That's simply because if they're missing out, they're just being very foolish. There are so many other countries that are nervous about their uh, money. But uh, India's concern mainly is probably uh, about so many scams that take place in the country rather than Bitcoin itself. So where is the value? Right. Well, how, how does Bitcoin actually have value? So let's have a look at this example here. If you have a calculator, for example, and you made a simple calculation of two plus two equals to four, what you've done is you've punched four times, first the two, then the plus sign, then another two, then the equal to sign. But to get the four, you did not punch a fifth time. The computer, the calculator gave you the, the answer. You only punched four digits. And the fifth one was your result after you hit the equal to sign. So you performed four hash functions and you got one result. Bitcoin works on a similar basis. But imagine if somebody paid you to make a lot of calculations, then would that be worth value or not? Because you're doing work, right? You're doing work for somebody. If you had to do a lot of calculations in a day, and somebody agreed to pay you X amount of dollars per hour or whatever, or per calculation, then you, that calculation has a value attached to it. It is taking somebody's effort and time, isn't it? So this is how uh, Bitcoin, this is the actual original Genesis uh, uh, block hex code. Um, uh, don't even try to understand this. I certainly don't understand it. If you're, if, if you're a genius, you probably will. Uh, or if you're a programmer, you'll probably know what this means. But basically, this is the complexity of transactions that have to be hashed. Like just how your four transactions here were four hashes that resulted in one final product. That's how these hashes resulted in Bitcoin. So what does Bitcoin actually look like? We'll have a look in a moment. But first of all, just to identify where the value actually lies. A lot of currencies in the past were usually gold-based or gold-backed or gold standard or gold reference, whatever you want to call it. Until 2015, even the Swiss franc was 20% or 40%, I believe, gold-backed. Uh, the, the dollar was uh, had a gold standard till 1971. Um, and some currencies were literally just direct gold in the ancient times. And all of this is because gold has the value. It's not the currency that has the value. The currency has value only because there is gold behind it. The same applies to Bitcoin. Bitcoin has value because there is proof of work. What is that proof of work? Well, that whole calculation. You know, imagine doing this calculation manually and having to pay somebody to do this calculation. That is where the value comes, and therefore Bitcoin has value because of proof of work. If this concept is understood, even the skeptics of Bitcoin will begin to realize that there is value attached to something that is created because of a lot of effort. Now, a lot of people argue that eh, it's just you know digits on a computer. Who cares? Bitcoin is worthless. If the internet went down, it would go down, blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, you know, to some degree, some of the critics and skeptics do have a point. But uh, realistically, we are talking about a currency for the internet. And now you're assuming that the internet might disappear. If the internet disappears, well, a lot of countries uh, will be thrown uh, several hundred years back into the Middle Ages. So, well, you know, we, we, we will suffer all very, very badly if something terrible happened uh, to this uh, uh, way of life we've gotten used to. But uh, the example below here I wanted to give you is uh, both here are dollars. One is the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, and the other is the United States dollar. And Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, this is the $100 trillion note. $100 trillion note. And it is virtually worthless. And yet the dollar here seems to have some value. What's the difference in the two? They're both pieces of paper. They both have ink. They both have print. They're both issued by some form of central authority. Yet one has uh, a value. The other has no value. And both are actually backed by nothing at all, no gold whatsoever. So the idea here is that our perception gives the United States dollar some value. Everybody else's perception, because they would rather accept this as a form of payment than the Zimbabwe dollar, even though this has several times more zeros on it, it is actually 
that many more times worthless than the US dollar, right? So does gold have value? Yes, this is a chart I posted in uh, our F Facebook group. If you have a, a few minutes to take a look at it, I've tried to compare precious metals, uh, gold and silver specifically, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, uh, then against dollar, euro, pound, and any other fiat currency, that against real estate, property, and land, that against other precious metals such as platinum, palladium, and rhodium. And a lot of time people ask, why not diamonds and gemstones and pearls, etc.? Well, they have unique weaknesses, and uh, almost none of them are used. And one critical point to note here is as a bank reserve currency, no bank will hold diamonds as a reserve currency. They will not hold platinum as a reserve currency. So these are uh, nice things to maybe have some point in your life, but these are not actual money. On the other hand, Bitcoin is not yet used as a reserve currency, but guess what? Banks are getting more and more interested in blockchain technology, and they will get into this uh, 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 sometime or the other, sooner rather than later, I believe. But here is an example why gold has value, and you can read all these points. Uh, 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 as I said, the whole chart is in, in the Facebook group. Um, basically, uh, uh, gold and silver is not limited to any uh, type of politics. Uh, whether right wing, left wing, centrist, uh, center left, center right, doesn't really matter. It's apolitical completely, and the same applies to cryptocurrency, same as with gold and silver. Accepted worldwide? Well, yes, uh, except for a few countries that are trying to block Bitcoin right now, but for 90 plus countries, it is perfectly acceptable as a form of payment. This includes most of the Western nations. So, yes, gold and silver is acceptable as well. Is it authentic wealth? Well, Bitcoin is getting to be authentic wealth because, as you've seen, you know, uh, uh, just uh, last couple of days, some people have made a small fortune out of court for, uh, cryptocurrency uh, because of the fork in Bitcoin and everything else that has happened. So, uh, uh, if they sold that and took that money and went and purchased uh, or paid off their mortgage, would it be authentic wealth? Yes, of course. So it has real practical value, and therefore Bitcoin is authentic wealth, but so is also gold. You could do exactly the same with gold. And its authenticity, this is, this is why I put a little fire symbol here, that's a, a, a red hot quality that you must bear in mind. And overall, you will see gold and Bitcoin, generally speaking, have a lot of overlap and a lot of mutually shared uh, qualities. Take some time to have a look at this chart if, if you get the chance. So why am I comparing gold with Bitcoin in this case? Well, it's very simple. If you understand gold, you should have no problem understanding Bitcoin. And it's just that Bitcoin is a digital version of gold. Uh, it's not backed by uh, gold, but it has its own intrinsic value. So here is one of the world's largest uh, deep pit mines. As you can see, this giant hole in the ground here, uh, it literally, uh, makes these buildings look like tiny little dwarves. These are like six and seven story buildings in the background. An entire town would fit into this giant hole in the ground. That's basically how much dirt had to be shifted to get uh, some good stuff out of the earth. Now, in a gold mine, one ton of rock is required to get, on average, to get just five grams of gold. So you have to move a million grams of dirt to get five grams of gold or 200 kilograms to get just one gram. One gram is the size of your little finger's uh, nail, the nail on your uh, pinky finger. And you know, it, that's the one gram uh, size and you'd have to move uh, weight as much as, uh, you know, uh, two rather large heavy people um, uh, to, to get just that tiny little fingernail. If you compare how much effort goes into getting just one gram, now the same thing or similar thing applies to Bitcoin. Uh, as at June 2017, to get just one Bitcoin per day, you would need 2,830 uh, terahash per second per day. This is per day. So if you don't have 2,800 uh, terahash, don't panic just yet. Um, if you had a tenth of it, basically you would get uh, 10 times less per day. Uh, and that would still be a great performance. That means you'd earn one Bitcoin every 10 days. But, you know, 2,830 terahash per second per day. What does terahash per second mean? Well, 
terahash is basically a number which is 10 raised to the power of 12 and expressed here below it's 2 comma 83 and that many zeros that many hash transactions have to take place that many calculations have to that many entries have to take place in 24 hours to produce just one bitcoin is this proof of work or not imagine if you had to manually do that many transactions you would not be able to complete them in a lifetime and that's why it needs very sophisticated computers Ordinary computers cannot handle these kind of transactions. There are just too many of them. They would burn out and blow up your computer if you were to push that many transactions through. It would just crash, uh, especially Windows anyway. But it would crash if you tried to do this. So in short, there is a direct comparison here. In a digital way, this is like moving a shed load of dirt to get one gram or one equivalent one unit of bitcoin if you were to consider gold one unit well, one gram as a unit but obviously there's traditional ways of measuring gold like ounces and all that so but we, we i'm just trying to keep it very very simple one gram gold 200 kilos moved that many transactions to give you just one bitcoin per day and this is as of last uh, two months ago so it would have gone up even more than this uh, I couldn't find any more recent figures than this, uh, so uh, th th that's why I've used this one. But this is what the proof of work really is. You know, you, you have first of all your cost of the hashing machine. Just as you know, uh, this whole hole was not dug up by hand. There's giant uh, machines involved in moving dirt and shifting it and loading it onto uh, dumper trucks and tippers. Uh, and then they take it to a, a somewhere where they separate it with a lot of water and a lot of steam and all kinds of machinery. So similarly, there's a cost of getting this hashing machine. Plus, you have to get a special power adapter that usually costs extra, and people don't talk about it, but it costs more. Then there is your 24-7 cost of electricity. So if you're in a high uh, tariff area, it's not a good idea to mine at home cost of delivery plus cost of cooling it down because although there's a fan attached here uh, it may overheat uh, especially on a hot summer's day so you do need to try and uh, make sure that the environment around it is, is as cool as possible besides it make a lot of annoying noise now this is a Baikal mini cube uh, this miner is able to do multi algorithms so you can do x11 dash coin uh, monero uh, uh, ethereum even and bitcoin so it can it can handle Bitcoin as well. It's 150 mega hash per second, plus minus 10% depending on performance. And the whole unit, this whole box will cost you about $1,600 minus the power adapter. You have to pay for that extra, uh, plus the cost of delivery. Plus then you have to, when you've connected it, you will be paying a lot more in your uh, uh, electricity bill. But basically the cost of producing Bitcoin includes all these factors listed above. Now, what we do at Cisco Global is we use Genesis Cloud Mining. This 150 mega hash per second contract for two years will cost you $750. So the reason I'm mentioning this is the same proof of work. You can try and do it privately and pay for electricity separately, or you can do it here, but it's limited to two years because uh, 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 that's just how these altcoin contracts for Ethereum, etc., are uh, structured. The uh, cost, $750, includes the electricity cost up front, and the rest of the uh, two years, you'll be getting pure cryptocurrency produced and sent to you. Now, how is it actually born? This is the whole point, right? So it's very, very simple. You get one of those miners. If you're at home, get one of those miners and get mining. It's very easy. Connect it to your laptop, download a bit of software. The instructions usually come with it. Uh, if not, there are plenty of blogs that will show you how to do it. And then push your product to get verified. Uh, you need a node. Uh, you need to have a node computer. And push your uh, transaction through to the blockchain. And finally, it will go into your wallet, the, the same kind of wallet we'd seen earlier with the seller. Now, another way to do it is you join a bunch of other people, and you pull together, and you do the same process, and you can create Bitcoin at all. Or you can do cloud mining contracts, which is what we do mainly. We subcontracted 
through, we are subcontractors basically through a giant mining operation, the largest altcoin miner in the world and the third largest Bitcoin miner in the world. And um, we are returning 96% per annum as of 2nd of August uh, today. Uh, so if today you had a contract, you'd be averaging about 98, 96% for the rest of the year. This is our option. And this is a easier, more user-friendly option if you wanted to uh, create Bitcoin and have a share of that Bitcoin. But it's very, very simple. You know, the, this machine is meant to do a lot of transactions. When those transactions are complete, that many millions, as you saw here before, that many transactions are complete, you will get one Bitcoin. Except the, the power supply here may be a little less than, you know, 2,830 terahash is a, uh, a lot of these boxes put together. But if you can't afford a, a lot of those boxes, then basically you would agree to earn maybe one Bitcoin over a few months. And you can make one Bitcoin that way just by mining. And you can come in with a much smaller budget than $1,600. So why is Bitcoin secure? Well, basically, cryptography is something that was originally invented by NASA. Um, they wanted a way of securely encrypting information so they can transfer it in uh, whatever missions they do or pretend to have. And um, they created some algorithms. And obviously, there are some clever people supposedly working there. And um, so basically, Bitcoin mining comes out of a cryptographic algorithm. So the mining algorithm is also known as SHA-256, which simply means secure hash algorithm 256 bits. 256 bits equates to about 32 bytes. Don't worry about what that is. Um, if you wanted to know what that is, right here, as a formula, it would look like this. Now, if you're not a math whiz, in my case, I'm not. I certainly don't understand what this actually means. So it would be a string of numbers. This would be a string of numbers, all these over here put together, that would form an SHA-256 uh, uh, string. Now, this string, it would take you 3 times 10 raised to the power of 51 years. That's 3 times 10, so 30 followed by 51 zeros that many years to hack into this code. That's how secure Bitcoin really is. And if you did hack into this particular code, you would destroy the Bitcoin. Why would you do that? So this is where there is very high security attached to the Bitcoin itself. Not to say that you know wallets can be hacked, uh, exchanges can be hacked, your credit card can be hacked, but Bitcoin itself, hacking it, is senseless. It doesn't yield anything. It doesn't produce anything. Hacking one Bitcoin isn't going to give you two or three Bitcoin. And even if it did, just how much effort would you have to put in even just trying to hack it? So its security is built into its long, complicated code here. And that's how we know that each Bitcoin that hits the blockchain can be verified as such as being an authentic Bitcoin, it is impossible, literally impossible, to fake a Bitcoin. Nobody can send you a fake Bitcoin if you're using all the right tools. Now, this is one thing that I've been wanting to cover for a while, but a lot of people don't understand that the difficulty level of the mining is the strength of Bitcoin. The chart here above is basically what the price of Bitcoin was doing. It was very low and flat, and most of us are kicking ourselves for not buying a bucket load right here and then you know, seeing some enjoyable profits uh, around uh, late 2013. And then it flatlined a little bit, and then it shot up, and now it's again back in the 3,000 range, 2,600, 2,700 right now, and it's in an amazing range. But you know, if you're a Bitcoin miner, if you're involved in the process of creating Bitcoin and therefore getting a little bit of a reward and you're earning Bitcoin at the rate of this 96% per annum return on, on your mining contract, then one thing that will constantly be annoying and bugging you 
is the fact that this difficulty rate keeps climbing. What does that mean? When the difficulty rate keeps climbing, only because more and more people are joining the uh, uh, mining uh, business. More and more people are joining. If you haven't yet joined mining, then if you're going to procrastinate and wait and delay it, by the time you join, the difficulty rate will be a little higher than it is now. So you'll be joining at a slightly different uh, 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 return, but not necessarily a lower return. I'll explain that in just a moment. The difficulty rate is here, the pink chart. It is constantly climbing and is climbing because there is more and more hash power being added to the system. More hash power being added to the system, more is the difficulty rate climbing. The two are interrelated. But so also is the price. And the next graph, I've already used this once before, but when the difficulty level increases, that means Bitcoin has an intrinsic value that increases. There is more value to Bitcoin when difficulty goes up. If there is more value to Bitcoin if difficulty goes up, people are willing to pay a higher price for it. So increasing price means increasing profit to you as a miner. So everything increases. Difficulty going up is a good thing for you because sooner or later, its price will move up just to keep up with the difficulty and vice versa. The difficulty will also move up to keep up with the price at some point because more people will come in, more difficulty goes up. It's all more, more, more up until a certain point, which is, it's a little old now, but it's not 10,065, uh, it's a little less than that. But there will come a time in June 2020 when Bitcoin will become suddenly twice as hard to mine. And it has been happening for a while. This is simply known as uh, the uh, Bitcoin era, basically, where in the first era, you could mine 50 Bitcoins per block. And the blocks could be processed relatively fast because there weren't too many people involved. Difficulty rate was really low. And a teenager with a simple laptop in his bedroom could actually create Bitcoin out of nothing uh, without buying any of those expensive machines. But then in the second era, the blocks were halved, so only 25 Bitcoins per block were being produced. And this is deliberate. Why? Because look, if you look at this mining pit here, oh, bear with me. If you look at this mining pit here, when they started digging the top layer and found some gold, um, it was great, wasn't it? They found gold and they had only dug the top layer. Now the trucks have to travel in a spiral lower and lower and lower. The digging is harder and harder and harder. And they have to come back more and more and more. So difficulty increases no matter how you look at it. The first gram mine uh, only had the first 200 kilos moved. But the 10,000 uh, a gram mined is 10,000 times 200 kilos moved, right? So it's the same logic with this mining uh, algorithm. The difficulty rate was factored into the, the uh, calculation for Bitcoin for this simple reason, that it, if it remains easy peasy, there would be no value to it. If anybody, you know, uh, sending dozens and dozens of emails a day, if they started, if they stopped their email scam business and instead started creating Bitcoin on their own computer, well, everybody would be creating Bitcoin on their own computer. Then Bitcoin would be just like the dirt. But for it to remain like the gold rather than the dirt, um, it would have to have something that gives it that little bit of struggle. And this uh, difficulty is exactly that rate of struggle. So for a period of time between uh, June 2012 and June uh, 2016, only 25 were being mined per block. Then as of June 2016, 12 and a half are being mined for another thousand and something days. And after that, it'll come down to 6.725 per block. So it'll keep going down. But look, this is what I've shown you this before. I'm sure in the last Hangout, if you, if you haven't seen it, please uh, have a look. But basically, as the difficulty rate goes steeply and sharply up, so did the actual return on mining. 
It went from 55% in November to 70% in April to 90% in July 2017. We are in August, and it's already at 96% today because not only is the price shooting through the roof, but so also is the difficulty level. Remember, difficulty level going up appears to you as if you are mining less, but it's actually adding intrinsic value to Bitcoin, which will eventually show up on your positive cash balance as a good thing, as increased profit. So there's no way of beating around the bush here. Difficulty rate is a good thing. It is the main characteristic of Bitcoin that gives it intrinsic value. It is where you really have to prove that work has been done in order to even create a Bitcoin. That's all from me for today. I'd love to see if there's any questions. Uh, and if you enjoyed it, please do like the video. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to try and see if uh, I can catch up with any of the messages uh, in, the, in the chat window, maybe on the mobile. And if uh, there's any questions you have, uh, I'll try and answer them now. Um, so bear with me. Don't even know where I am. My channel. Okay. Uh, could someone tell me the name of the Facebook group he mentioned? Myra Key. Hey, Myra. I'm, I'm going to post the link uh, on this video, but I'm sure one of our members, uh, there's a lot of familiar faces already on here. So please, uh, if somebody could uh, share the uh, link, I'm just going to try and mute myself. Um, uh, unfortunately, my trusty friend isn't here, so uh, otherwise he would have checked all these messages. Um, uh, could someone tell me the group? Yeah. Uh, brilliantly explained. No questions, guys. What's going on? I thought I was hoping there'd be some questions. Well, while we're here, I'll just give you a little rundown on my personal humble opinion on Bitcoin Cash. Um, there's a number of exchanges and also wallets um, that have done one of two things. Uh, first of all, uh, some of the exchanges haven't released the Bitcoin Cash allocations to their members. Exodus was severely delayed. That's one of them. Uh, but some others also exchanges, they haven't released the Bitcoin Cash that is owed to the members. So those uh, people holding assets in certain exchanges and wallets, they did not see the uh, Bitcoin Cash coming in. That means there is a backlog. And because of that backlog, the uh, uh, exuberant prices you're seeing may continue a little while longer. They may even go uh, significantly higher than what you've seen uh, so far. Um, but some of the exchanges, Poloniex is one of them, they changed their terms and conditions exactly on the right day, and they said, you can't sue us in case you're missing some coins. right? And you had to accept it. And if you didn't accept it, they offered you to close your account and leave. So basically, for all the Poloniex members, they just kept the Bitcoin cash for themselves. Crooks, yeah? Uh, absolute crooks. And they, they varied their terms. But this is the trouble. We are in an unregulated industry, and these things can happen. So this is on the one hand. Uh, but Bitcoin Cash, there's only a small number of miners. They've only just mined their first block yesterday. Um, and they're only just beginning. So what does it actually mean? Well, it simply means that um, uh, all of us collectively mining Bitcoin, we are part of the daily creation of blocks. Yeah, And some of them decided, we don't want to create this anymore. We've got this computing power that we're going to divert into creating a new Bitcoin. So where does this Bitcoin Cash come from? And actually, Bitcoin Cash is not a coin. It is a token. Uh, it doesn't actually exist. The first block was just mined yesterday, right? So uh, how, how did so many thousands and thousands and millions of members get paid their Bitcoin Cash if they've only mined one, the first block yesterday? Where did that come from? It's a token. And the token is then replaceable by a coin as it is mined. They're hoping more and more people will join them, the rebels. And when the people join them, more and more coins and the, your tokens will get replaced by the real coin. You won't know the difference between the two. So it's basically a paper promise without anything backing it. Okay, But 
the reality is that the, the majority of the serious uh, uh, people that uh, originally subscribe to the philosophy and the idea of Satoshi Nakamoto, they will go and stick with Bitcoin Core for the time being, even if Bitcoin Cash exceeds uh, uh, the regular Bitcoin and uh, you know appears to do whatever. There are people with a lot of deep wallets pumping it to make it attractive to people. But there will be people wanting to book a profit, and when they dump it, it'll come crashing down. So don't take it too seriously. If you've got some Bitcoin cash, and if, if you've made some benefit out of it, that's amazing. Uh, I have personally booked profit out of it. Uh, I made, uh, I had about uh, 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 30 of them, so when I sold them, um, I made a decent uh, 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 profit, but I got out a little too early, maybe, I, you know, I was a little more nervous than I should have been. But, you know, regardless of that, um, uh, if you've got Bitcoin Cash, when you see it, when you receive it, if the price seems right to you, $600, $700, whatever, sell it, yeah? Because you can always buy back later. It will have to dip. Nothing, none of these cryptocurrencies keep going up in a straight line except a fraud currency like the billion coin or something. Other than those, uh, you know, none of these cryptocurrencies keep going up in a straight time, a straight line. So when it crashes, keep a lookout if you're even interested in it. If not, just enjoy the value you're able to extract for doing absolutely nothing, thanks to Roger Ver. But on the other hand, don't take it too seriously because they want bigger blocks. Bigger blocks make the system less secure. Yeah. Yes, it delays transactions, and yes, it increases the cost of transactions, and we know. But segregated witness was the solution by the core community to help improve the blockchain and to help improve it in a graduated, gradual way to help it in a regulated, managed, consensus way, rather than some rebel coming and saying, hey, I'm Al Capone, I'm going to do my own stuff, you know, I don't care about the feds. And, you know, that's what these, these cowboys are doing. And I wouldn't take it too seriously, to be honest with you. So I hope, guys, this was a useful uh, presentation. Feel free to share it. Someone wants to know what Bitcoin is. It simply is a new currency that you cannot afford to ignore. And none of the concepts of Bitcoin are too complicated. You have at no point are you required to figure out how the programming works. You are at no point, you know, eventually you will get to understand what are private keys, what are public keys. You know, those are kind of things that you will learn as you go along, as you get more involved. We have such a vibrant group that shares so much information. Um, I've been a little bit out of the loop with the, some of the chat groups, but, you know, we have all the talent uh, amongst you right here. Uh, and you are very well supported, I believe, compared to many, many other businesses. And it's such a fantastic, transparent business. One last thing I want to tell you is, uh, before, before we call it a day, um, uh, is that Genesis Mining restored seven days of missing payments and told you two days it will be shut down just to make sure there is no errors with this Bitcoin cash. So the hack that happened before this fork is a separate issue and then came the fork which is a separate issue so there are two intervals if the hack didn't happen you'd be paid for the seven days anyway and you would still have to wait these two days august 1st and august 2nd because of the uh, um, uh, uh, suspension of services because of the fork you would all have to wait anyway but listen what i really want to tell you is this this is a company that could have easily said, sorry, we were hacked, something went wrong, we'll restore your payments, but what you've lost, you've lost. They had no logical reason to come back and give you seven days worth of payments from literally the company's own wallet. Yeah, This is the confidence and the strength we have in uh, being able to tell people, how many companies do you know? How many companies do you know that uh, say we got hacked and then disappeared and you're left guessing well was it the owner who took the money and ran off or was it uh, actually a hack or what actually happened we don't know and was it hackers what another and, and you know there's so much uncertainty and suddenly the whole website has vanished from the internet and everything is shut down and thousands of people have lost their money here they have come back and it's almost as if they were embarrassed 
that they were even allowed a hacker to come in. Now, earlier today we had a conversation. People asked me, uh, well, how does this hack actually work? Why, how come Genesis got hacked? You know, It's very, very simple, guys. Bitcoin can't be hacked. It's pointless hacking Bitcoin. But the wallet can be hacked. Now, there, there are many ways in which security breaches can take place. Someone got access to some of the keys and got hold of the hot wallet of uh, 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 Genesis. And therefore, they were able to make a few transactions real quickly when they spotted these, that these are not authorized transactions. What's going on? Shut! And they blocked everything. But the thing is, I personally am glad that this happened because we have lost nothing. But Genesis are on fire now. They have a challenge to never allow this to happen again. They will deploy the best engineers, the best software people, everything necessary. They will throw. Their reputation is at stake. They cannot afford to have a bad name in the market. And this is why I think it was actually a good thing that it happened, so that they are now up to speed with things, and they are not going to mess around anymore. But we now have an argument to everybody else. There are systems and companies out there, I'm not going to name them, but you know what I'm talking about, that pay you 40% less. So not only would they have gotten 40% less, but if their power supply is also Genesis, um, well, Genesis paid them everything owed according to their hash power. Did they distribute everything, or did they withhold 40% from the last seven days payment as well? That exposes just how crooked the companies can be that work with Genesis. Here, Swiss Gold Global had absolutely no obligation to do or say anything. We had a nice explanation from the CEO by email to say, this is what happened. This is what you expect. You know, We are hoping this will be restored. Don't worry. Everything is under control because the best people in the world are actually working for you. And you need to understand, Genesis Mining treat us as partners. That's why they paid us. They didn't have to. For the, for the hacked amount for the missing seven days worth. They treat us as partners, and that, I believe, is a sign of very honorable business practices, very good ethics. And uh, I would be nervous dealing with some company that doesn't even understand my language. But this, these people, they're almost as if it's, it's a matter of their honor, and they have honored uh, us by paying us back. So I hope this was useful, guys. Uh, feel free to share the video, rip it, take it, whatever you want. Uh, I wish you well. And next week, we'll try and cover the mark of the beast. So I introduced a little bit of the revelation uh, through the, the the whore of Babylon, which is, uh, you know, bizarrely, European Union uh, did not have to use that motif, but they repeatedly use that. Either they don't know what they're talking about, and they're just using it thinking, oh, this is some you know something great, and they feel proud to use it, or it is literally scary so anyway we'll cover uh, bitcoin banking and the beast uh, and some of the history of banking because i think a lot of misinformation floats around the internet and i'll do my best to try and keep it simple as usual all right guys thank you very much for being here thanks for your time and we'll catch up soon bye bye